In the early 1800s, the city known today as Lagos in modern-day Nigeria was one of the major ports for the export of West African slaves to North and South America. Now, while British traders had once been major players in the slave trade, mounting pressure from missionary groups and a spike in demand for palm oil as a machine lubricant following the Industrial Revolution meant that the British government would now begin battling other European powers to bring an end to the slave trade and gain monopoly access to the region's palm oil and other industrial raw materials. Prior to this change in policy, the slave trade had been sustained by a triangular system of exchange that had lasted for over 300 years. African slaves were captured and sold by local kings, chiefs and military generals to European traders who would then transport them to the Americas and the Caribbean islands to work in plantations producing materials like sugar and cotton. These products would then be shipped over to European factories where they would be made into finished goods like clothing, rum and brandy that would then be shipped over to Africa along with other items such as guns, clocks and leather goods to be exchanged for more slaves. Breaking the established order, the new British strategy will now be firmly focused on keeping African labour within its shores as the continuing demand for slaves on the West African coastline was causing a serious labour shortage on the mainland which was hampering its agricultural productivity. The trade had also made the region generally more dangerous and unstable as long-standing tribal wars that had been going on years before the arrival of Europeans were now even more bloody thanks to the introduction of guns and cannons acquired from European traders. Many local kings and chiefs were also now seeking to subdue neighboring tribes and expand their territories. So the cities and villages surrounding the coastlines were continually being raided by gun-wielding militias looking to capture and sell slaves on the coasts in exchange for more weapons. If the British government was to ensure safe and efficient access to the region's resources, the slave trade fueled violence and instability would need to be brought to an end. Britain got to work by passing anti-slavery laws and also establishing an anti-slavery navy squadron which began intercepting slave ships in the region and returning the captives to shore. However, the slave trade showed no sign of slowing down as it was simply too profitable for the local rulers and the mainly Portuguese slave traders that now dominated the market. Britain needed a more permanent solution and luckily for them, a long-standing rivalry between two Yoruba kings would present them with the perfect opportunity. In the 1840s, Oba Akitoye and Oba Kusoko were involved in a bitter rivalry for the throne of Lagos. Oba Akitoye had been crowned king of Lagos in 1841, but his rival, Oba Kusoko, believed that he should have been crowned king based on a true reading of the Lagos king-making traditions. In 1845, Kosoka forcefully removed Akitoye from the throne and crowned himself king, forcing Akitoye and his supporters into exile. Although he previously had no moral objections to slavery, Akitoye contacted the British government and promised to sign a treaty banning the slave trade in Lagos and granting British missionaries and merchants exclusive access to the region provided the British army would help him regain the throne. Following a battle referred to by locals as Ogun Agidengbi, which can be roughly translated as the Bowling Battle, the British Royal Navy inflicted a heavy defeat on Oba Kosoko and his army of over 5,000 men and reinstalled Akitoye as the King of Lagos. As agreed, Akitoye passed a law banning slavery in Lagos and granted the British government and its citizens significant privileges and influence in the region. The rest, as they say, is history. Oba Akitoye died two years later and his son Oba Dosumu was forced to sign a treaty turning Lagos into a British colony just seven years after his father's death. With slavery abolished and Lagos now a full British colony, Portuguese influence in the region dissipated and Lagos became a commercial hub for the export of palm oil and other raw materials sourced from the surrounding regions. Following the infamous Berlin Conference of 1884, the map of modern Nigeria was outlined for further exploration and conquest and Sir George Tobman Godey's Royal Niger Company was authorized to secure the territory. Recruiting and enlisting many local militias to its cause, the Royal Niger Company embarked on a campaign to conquer the territory and within just over a decade, it had forcefully secured over 400 treaties from various local rulers pledging their allegiance and granting full legislative and judicial authority to the company. After having established itself as a de facto government of a region encompassing over 250 ethnic groups and over 400 languages, the Royal Niger Company officially transferred control of Nigeria to the British government on the 1st of January 1900, receiving £865,000 as compensation. Just as a side note, the Royal Niger Company still exists today as part of Unilever PLC, the company behind popular brands like Ben & Jerry's, Lipton, Dove and Vaseline. Recognizing the vast differences between the people in the region, the British initially divided the new territory into a southern Nigerian protectorate which had become majority Christian 
and the Northern Nigerian Protectorate, which had remained majority Muslim. However, while Southern Nigeria was very productive and ran at a budget surplus due to its abundant natural resources and its people's embrace of education and commerce, the North was a largely loss-making enterprise that cost the British more to administer than they gained in the trade of its raw materials. It has been suggested that the financial woes of the Northern Protectorate was due to a combination of its relatively fewer natural resources and the strong Islamic culture in the region, which was very resistant to secular education. Needing an urgent solution to the Northern Nigerian budget deficit, British High Commissioner Frederick Lagarde decided that it would be a great idea to join the two vastly different regions together into one united political entity. And to the dismay of many protesting Southern Nigerians, the two protectorates were amalgamated in 1914 to form a single British colony of Nigeria which would ultimately become the Federal Republic of Nigeria we know today. As another side note, many scholars believe that it was Lugard's wife, Flora Shaw, who named the country Nigeria after the river Niger that runs across the territory. So in more ways than one, Nigeria was never a very Nigerian idea to begin with. Rather than being some kind of mythical homeland of the Nigerian people, a more accurate description based solely on its origin story would be to describe it as a corporate entity that was formed to ensure the profitable exploitation of the natural resources in the geographical areas that surround the Niger River. And nearly 60 years after gaining independence from British rule in 1960, my country Nigeria still seems to conform to the original purpose for which it was formed. The only difference now is that rather than lining the pockets of the shareholders of the Royal Niger Company, its resources now line the pockets of the Nigerian elite. Having discovered over 37 billion barrels of oil reserves under its soil, modern-day Nigeria may have ditched palm oil for the more profitable crude oil, but the status quo remains very much the same. The only Nigerians that seem to benefit from the country's natural wealth are the elites that own oil wells and the government officials tasked with managing the resource. Despite a failing education system, poor infrastructure, insecurity, and mass unemployment, Nigerian politicians are arguably some of the best-paid politicians in the world. A recent report by Nigerian news station Channels TV estimated that Nigerian senators earn as much as $80,000 a month in wages and allowances, meaning that they are paid over 10,000 times more than the Nigerian minimum wage and over 200 times more than its GDP per capita. All this in a country where nearly 87 million people live on less than a dollar a day. Indeed, life for the average Nigerian has become so hard that the goal for many is to live anywhere else but Nigeria. To draw a shocking comparison, while an estimated 10.5 million African slaves were involuntarily taken out of Africa over the 300 years of the transatlantic slave trade, some estimates suggest that the number of Nigerians voluntarily living outside of Nigeria has grown to over 15 million since its independence in 1960. From popular destinations like the US, UK and Canada, to places like Russia, Ukraine and Malaysia, Nigerians are choosing to endure all kinds of prejudice, climates and harsh treatments just to make a better life for themselves and their families. Just like the Royal Niger Company and its pre-independence colonial administrators ran Nigeria primarily for the benefit of themselves and the British Empire, in many ways, the current generation of Nigerian elites do exactly the same. But perhaps to a much more extreme degree, as they now work not just for the benefit of Britain, but for the rest of the Western world as well. How exactly, you might ask? Well, first and foremost, by looting and sending billions and billions of dollars worth of oil revenues that should be kept and reinvested into the local economy, to European banks to just sit and accumulate interest. By stimulating the London property market with their endless acquisitions of rows and rows of expensive London properties. By paying eye-watering amounts in tuition fees for their children to study abroad while their local institutions rot away. And by championing European industry and exports with their insatiable appetite for imported luxury cars, clothing and perishable goods. So while they might hold Nigerian passports and outwardly claim to be proud Nigerians, their actions show that they do not feel any true sense of solidarity with their fellow Nigerians. And oddly enough, their way of thinking is actually not that surprising when you understand where they're coming from. You see, it's very hard to feel any real sense of duty to a country that you have no real attachment to. Raised by parents and grandparents who saw nothing in common with the hundreds of neighboring tribes that were involuntarily bound together, in the artificially constructed profit-making machine called Nigeria, the current generation of Nigerian elites were never going to suddenly put down their ethnic prejudices and embrace a bright vision of one Nigeria simply because it now had a new flag, a new anthem and a new team of black administrators. 
One question that is often asked is why nearly 60 years after gaining independence, the Nigerian elite have not simply opted to undo the colonial structures and divide the country along its pre-colonial ethnic lines. This is a very complicated question, but the simple answer is that a breakup of Nigeria would cause a lot of wealthy and powerful people to lose a lot of wealth and power. And the millions of lives that were lost during the 1967 to 1970 Biafran War show just how far those who benefit from Nigeria's existence would be willing to go to keep Nigeria going. But here's the thing, regardless of how it came to be or why it still exists in its original colonial form, the reality is that the hopes and dreams of over 200 million people now depend on the success or failure of Nigeria. And moreover, there is now an ever-growing number of young people for whom Nigeria is their mythical homeland. Unlike their parents and grandparents, they really do see themselves as Nigerians as opposed to Igbo, Yoruba or Hausa. They speak Nigerian English as a first and in some cases only language. They hardly understand nor revere the historic traditions of their parents and instead identify more closely with the emerging contemporary Nigerian culture. A culture that is being built around the growing music, fashion and movie industry an ever-evolving shared language and a shared struggle to succeed in the midst of adversity. For these Nigerians, Nigeria is far from just a money-making venture. It is their one and only homeland, and they continually hope and dream of a day when it will be led by visionary and just leaders. But with minds deeply molded by their ethnocentric upbringings and their many years at the forefront of the neo-colonial exploitation of their country, Perhaps it is unrealistic to expect any serious change under the leadership of the current generation of Nigerian elites. The question that remains to be answered is whether the next generation of Nigerian leaders will be any different. Once again, it's KB Taiwo for New Africa. Please like, share and subscribe. And until next time.